when we think of animals, we usually think of dogs and cats and lions and tigers and bears, oh my, but the vast majority of known animal species are invertebrates. Uh, and a lot of them are wild in the way that they look and function. Uh, one example from your book is this Christmas tree worm, which has giant tentacles uh, for gas exchange and for feeding. And you may think looks nothing like an animal, but it is. It's an invertebrate organism. And as we discussed in our last chapter, this is the basic phylogeny for animals. And these are... Um, groups of phyla down here. And remember when I say phylum, um, this is the level of organization just below kingdom. So domain, like archaea, bacteria, eukarya. So we're in the domain eukarya. The next level of organization down broadly is kingdom. We are in the kingdom animalia, but there are also plantae and fungi, etc. Um, we're in the kingdom animalia, and then the next group down is phyla. But there are groups of phyla that are, are more or less closely related. So uh, Lophotrochozoa is a group of related phyla. Ectisozoa is a group of related phyla. Deuterostomia is a group of related phyla. Um, but all of them have a common ancestor, right? The phylum uh, or the, the kingdom animalia or Eumetazoa is a true clade, including a common ancestor and all of um, its descendants. Now, periphera, likely evolved and branched off from the rest of the animals first because they don't have true tissues um, and the rest of animals do. So we call the rest of animals eumetazoa, right? Um, within eumetazoa, cnidaria and a, a few other phyla like tenophorans, comb jellies, are all diploblastic, meaning they have true tissues, but they only have two layers of germ tissues, endoderm and ectoderm. Um, and they are radially symmetrical, right? They have, um, you, know, you can cut them through the middle in many different directions, more than, than one at least, and they're the same on both sides, so radially symmetrical. Um, whereas the rest of animals are bilaterally symmetrical, like us, right? There's only one place where you can cut us down the middle and, and we're the same on both sides. And also triploblastic. Uh, and then we have uh, deuterostomes, right? um, like us chordates and the echinoderms. And then we have two other groups, ectisozoans, which have a cuticle that they must molt in order to grow, but protects them. That includes arthropods and nematodes. And lophotrochozoa, which is a weird group of a bunch of other phyla. Um, sometimes um, some of those phyla don't seem like they should be together, but but the a few structures in common, and mostly the genetics um, you make us place them all together in that group of phyla. Lophotrochozoa includes phyla like platyhelminthes, or the flatworms, which we'll talk about. Um, some phyla within uh, Lophotrochozoa have what's called a lophophore, like these ectoprocs uh, and these brachiopods. They have a lophophore, which is this feeding structure. Um, it includes um, annelids, which are the segmented worms, like earthworms, and mollusks, uh, which are a very diverse group of species that include shelled organisms like clams and oysters, along with snails and squids and, and all sorts of, of other things that we'll talk about. Ictisozoa is the group of phyla that, that has that cuticle that they need to mold. And we'll talk about a couple of these phyla in great detail, specifically nematoda and arthropoda, because they are by far um, the most diverse phyla. They're two of the most diverse phyla in the animal kingdom, right? Nematodes are everywhere. And if you look at number of species, arthropods make up the vast majority of animal species. They've been very successful. And we may touch on a few other of these, specifically tardigrades, because they're interesting and also cute. Look at them. They're real cute. Sometimes they're called water bears. And that last group of species, Deuterostomia, has deuterostome development, as we discussed um, in the last chapter. Um, and this includes a few phyla. Uh, we're mostly going to touch on Echinodermata, which means spiny skin, and includes sea urchins and starfish, things like that. And Chordata, which includes things like tunicates, right? Um, sea squirts, and, um, and us. 
uh, but we are not invertebrates. So we'll, we'll touch on the, this phylum briefly to mention the invertebrates. And in the next chapter, chapter 34, we'll really dig into chordates, uh, specifically vertebrates. We're not going to talk much about hemichordata, not just because they look really weird, uh, but also because there just aren't that many of them, and we don't have that much time. And we're going to talk first about porifera, the sponges, because they are most likely the basal animals, meaning the group of animals that branched off from the rest of animals earliest. They're the least related to the rest of the animals. And we think that because they have uh, no true tissues, right, like the rest of, of animals, um, they have no symmetry. They're asymmetrical, whereas the rest of animals have either radial or bilateral symmetry. Um, and they're weird for animals. They're sedentary. Um, they live in waters, either marine or fresh. They are suspension feeders, and we'll look at an image in a moment, but um, they have these cells uh, called choanocytes that have flagellum on there, and they um, beat to create a flow of water, and they suck water in through these pores into um, the spongocele, which is the central cavity, and along the way in, they catch uh, organic debris, you know, food particles in the water, and they eat those, they clean them out. Uh, and then that water goes out through a little chimney at the top called an osculum. Here's a look at a relatively simple sponge, right? You can see a zoom in on these choanocytes and also amoebocytes um, that are found in here. Uh, these choanocytes create a flow of water that come through pores, which are often formed by cells called porocytes. And water comes in and particles there are captured by this collar. So these are sometimes called collar cells. Uh, and that food is consumed by the collar, but also uh, moved to the amoebocyte, which can transfer nutrients around um, the sponge. It can also become other kinds of cells. It also produces spicules. And spicules are these important pieces of essentially the skeleton of a sponge. They're these hard little, little uh, bits that can be made of um, either kind of a smushier protein or like calcium carbonate, or in some cases, silica, glass. There's a, a group of sponges called glass sponges that are just beautiful, uh, but it's all depending on the type of spicules that you have. And then water flows into this open space called a spongoseal, right? Remember, C-O-E-L always means cavity. So spongoseal means cavity in a sponge, right? And then water goes up through this osculum, which is the um, the outgoing uh, uh, pore. And sponges tend to be just a couple of cell layers thick between where there's water, uh, and, and that allows them to just exchange gases with uh, the outside world from, you know, with the cell alone, right? They don't need a special circulatory system. And then between those layers of cells, they have a gooey layer, a gelatinous non-cellular layer called mesohyl. Uh, and they reproduce sexually, but they're hermaphrodites. So essentially they will uh, produce sperm, release it out into the ocean, right? So there's sperm just swimming everywhere. Uh, and then those sperm will be caught uh, by other nearby sponges. Uh, and then uh, they will inseminate eggs in those sponges. Um, and in that way, you get new little baby sponges. Uh, sponges also sometimes can reproduce asexually because if they chunk off, those chunks can grow into new sponges because, again, those cells aren't very specialized. So it's not like my arm falling off and then it's just an arm laying there, right? It can't grow a brain or a spine. Um, but, you know, sponge cells can essentially become anything. Now, if we move along from sponges... Uh, we move into a different group called Eumetazoa, which again is all animals except for sponges. Sponges branched off the earliest, we believe. Um, and then the next earliest to branch off from the rest of animals would be um, a group that includes some radially symmetrical uh, organisms that have two tissue layers instead of three. So they're diploblastic, radially symmetrical organisms. And the most prominent clade amongst uh, this group is cnidaria, right? And so this is a look again at our phylogeny. Sponges or peripherans branch off first. All these are eumetazoans, okay? Um, cnidarians and some other phyla break off next. And then these are all bilaterally symmetrical critters. Um, again, cnidaria isn't the only one of these phyla, but they are the most 
uh, prominent, uh, most numerous, most diverse. And these radially symmetrical cnidarians um, include organisms like jellyfish, right? Those are probably the most famous cnidarians, but uh, corals and hydras are also cnidarians. Um, there are lots of other examples that we'll talk about, but they're all uh, diploblastic and radially symmetrical. They all have a single opening into a gastrovascular cavity. Um, gastrovascular means it's where the uh, they digest food, gastro, and vascular. It's also where they mush things around so that you can have some gas exchange with the cell layers that are on the inside as opposed to the outside. And that single opening functions as both mouth and anus. And we're not going to get to organisms with an anus for a little while here. Um, and that's a disadvantage, right? Um, not having an anus means that you can't bring in new food until you've gotten rid of the old food, right? Um, but they function pretty well with a single hole. Their life cycle can include two different uh, variations on the body plan. A polyp, which is sessile, it, it, it anchors itself to uh, the bottom of the ocean uh, and points its tentacles upward. And a medusa, which is, is uh, full of motion. And a medusa is what we think of when we think of a jellyfish, right? has a bell-shaped body with tentacles and a mouth on the underside, and they do not attach to the substrate. They float freely in the water. And here you can see on the left a polyp, right? It has this body stock with tentacles up the top and a mouth leading to a gastrovascular cavity here. We still have two layers of tissue, epidermis and gastrodermis, and the inside with some goo in the middle. Um, you essentially turn them upside down and you get the medusa, which has this bell on top, uh, mouth on the bottom leading to a gastrovascular cavity, again, gastrodermis and epidermis. And then here are the, um, the tentacles kind of all around the outside. Now, a lot of these cnidarians will have a polyp stage of their life and a medusa stage in their life. Uh, usually medusa is where you'll reproduce sexually, produce sperm and eggs, so there'll be gonads in here somewhere. Um, but not necessarily, right? Some organisms are polyps for their entire lives. Some organisms are medusae for their entire lives. The other uh, common shared characteristic among cnidarians is uh, these cells called nidocytes that you find in the tentacles. And this is how jellyfish sting. These nidocytes, which are what cnidarians are named after, have specialized organelles called nematocysts that eject a stinging thread. So if you zoom in on the tentacles here, right, you can see these nidocytes, these cells, uh, which have these big nematocyst organelles here, and they have a trigger on them. And this trigger, this is just a physical trigger. If something bumps this, it opens up this lid or operculum and there's a lot of hydrostatic pressure in here and it will shoot this thread out like a harpoon, right? It's attached to a thread, but on the end it's pointy and also um, usually has some sort of toxin on the end of it. There are four major classes of cnidarians. Again, the, the level of organization below phylum is class. Hydrozoa, Cyphozoa, Cubozoa, and Anthozoa. Hydrozoans alternate between polyp and medusa form, uh, and they also are frequently colonial, although the most famous one is hydra, which is weird in both these respects, in that it exists only in polyp form uh, and reduces, uh, reproduces asexually and is not colonial. This is a look at a colonial obelia, and all of these colonial individuals are attached together. So these are all little polyps. It has specialized feeding polyps and specialized reproductive polyps, and those reproductive polyps will make medusae that go up and become medusoid adults, which then make sperm and egg. And those sperm and egg then come together and fertilize and become a zygote, which then will plant itself onto the ground uh, as a larva uh, and will grow into a new polyp. Cyphozoans include jellyfish and are primarily uh, medusa in form. Cubozoans uh, look like jellyfish in that they have a medusa, but they're very, very toxic, and they look like a box or a cube, so they're called box jellies or sometimes sea wasps because of a deadly sting they have. The final class are anthozoans, which include sea anemones, which are primarily polyp form, and also coral, which are polyps that, that form these calcium carbonate shells that form this, this giant... Uh, habitat for a lot of other organisms at the bottom of the tropical ocean.